Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you for showing up tonight. Very excited to uh, be able to present for you virtually. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, though I had a, a excellent introduction from Anna May. Uh, again, I am Bob Pusateri. I'm coming to you uh, from Chicago, where I am fairly active in the data communities here. Uh, as we like to say about Chicago, come for the pizza, stay because you were murdered. Um, <clears throat> Probably the best thing on this slide you will find is my contact information. So if you uh, have any questions that we can't address during this meeting, or if you you know wake up at three o'clock in the morning with this dying desire to know something about something else I was talking about, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, best ways to find me are both Twitter and my email address, uh, which are on the screen there. I'll also have this up at the end. I will also have a link to all of the uh, materials that we go through today. So the slide deck, uh, the demo scripts, and the um, reference materials that I, I mention and, and have links to. So you can get all that um, from the link I post at the end. Um, if I have to cough or something, I will do my very, very best to hit my mute button immediately. Uh, so you don't have to listen to that. If I'm too slow, I apologize in advance. Uh, as far as questions go, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask uh, whenever Whenever the question comes to you, I will. I don't see the chat room, so I don't know if they're coming through that way. But if someone would want to uh, unmute themselves and speak up, that's absolutely fine. I'll also uh, have a couple different points during the presentation where I'll, I'll pause and explicitly ask for questions just because it's a good place. So our agenda for this evening, uh, I'm going to, this is an introductory level course on SQL Server Big Data Clusters. I don't know if anyone here has has worked with them yet or has uh, done some experimentation on their own, but this is a, a intro level session where we talk about what is a SQL Server Big Data Cluster. We'll go through the components and the architecture uh, of what makes them work, how they work, uh, a somewhat brief review, you could probably spend a few hours talking about the internals of, of Kubernetes and how a big data cluster is built on top of that, but we're going to cover that part fairly briefly because the majority of this session is going to be demonstrations, actually working with a big data cluster, showing you what you can uh, do with it and, and how some basic uh, demo type queries work. So to get started then, what is a SQL Server big data cluster? Well, SQL Server big data cluster is a, a product from Microsoft, it builds on SQL Server. So it is a SQL Server product and it allows for easy integration of both relational data that you would normally put in SQL Server with big data, right? You get Spark, you get Hadoop, you get other big data tools integrated into this package that runs on Kubernetes. Uh, it heavily leverages Polybase, which has been around in SQL Server for I feel like since 2014 maybe, uh, but Polybase had some significant enhancements in 2019, which really add to the functionality of a SQL Server big data cluster uh, and big data clusters or BDCs, as I will refer to them, uh, were, were introduced first with SQL Server uh, 2019. Um, you get this deep integration with Apache Spark and you can also integrate your data or access your data through Spark or through SQL Server, um, a couple different ways through SQL Server actually. Uh, and probably one of the cooler things about SQL Server big data clusters is they can run either in the cloud or they can run on premises, right? If you're thinking of uh, like, like Azure Synapse, for example, which is awesome, but Synapse is a cloud only product, big data clusters can run locally as well. Uh, the demonstration I'm going to be running tonight is running in Azure. It's running an Azure Kubernetes service. It's very easy for me to, to spin one up there and use it for my demos, so that's what I do, but I can also spin them up in my virtual machines here uh, at my home and do it there as well. So to kind of have a brief diagram of what a SQL Server big data cluster is, um, you'll see here and I'll, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointing or not, but at the bottom of the screen, we have nodes, right? These are actual compute nodes. These can be either physical or virtual machines. They'll probably be virtual machines in most cases. Uh, and the big blocks, the big back, blah, blah, I can't talk. The big black box uh, that they are encircling is Kubernetes, which is a, a hardware slash software abstraction layer. Um, again, you can, you can see many, many sessions and get very deep into what Kubernetes is, but Kubernetes is a technology that allows you to uh, spread containerized loads out across multiple services and give levels of, of high availability and redundancy uh, fairly easily. So a big data cluster runs in Kubernetes. Uh, you'll see in the bottom left there, there is the cube CTL or cube cuddle as some call it. This is a application for managing a Kubernetes cluster uh, inside of 
Kubernetes, we have the SQL Server Big Data Cluster, which is the reddish orangish box there. Uh, we have a couple tools in the Big Data Cluster as well. We have AZ Data, which is an Azure CLI uh, for managing uh, multiple things in Azure, but it's actually what allows us to build and manage a big data cluster. Uh, you typically want to use Azure Data Studio when you're connecting to a big data cluster uh, because it will make things. I don't know if the screen just flashed for you or not, but it did for me. Hang on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, Azure Data Studio will make managing a big data cluster and interacting it with uh, pretty simple and easy. It has some nice tools and uh, features for that, so that's what I'll be using. Uh, Big Data Cluster also exposes a whole bunch of web services uh, for connection and management. And then we have the major components of the Big Data Cluster, which are inside that cluster. green box. We have a master instance. I'm sorry, did someone say something? Is there a question? No, maybe not. Okay. Uh, we have the master instance. We have the SQL data pool. We have the storage pool, and there's also a compute pool and an application pool, which we won't really be discussing today. We'll be focusing on the master instance, the data pool, and the storage pool, and hold thoughts on those. I'll be getting to them in a little more detail in just a moment, like on this very next slide. So the master instance in a big data cluster is literally just a regular SQL Server instance in a big data cluster. Now, it is a SQL Server instance running on Linux, on Kubernetes, but it is a regular SQL Server instance. You can do basically anything with it you could do with the normal SQL Server instance. Uh, and this serves as your main endpoint for connecting to the BDC. You can connect to it with SSMS or Azure Data Studio, just like any other SQL Server instance. You get your, get your connection endpoint for it, connect to it, and congrats, you've connected to the master instance. If you're trying to do something like restore a database into the big data cluster, uh, you would actually restore the database to the master instance. And the master instance also will facilitate your communication with the other pools and features of the big data cluster. Um, and it has some metadata databases we'll take a look at as well. So you have, you'll have any databases you restore to it. You'll have any databases you create in the master instance. And there will be some, some additional ones that are not really system databases. They show themselves as as uh, user databases. However, they contain like the system level metadata for maintaining the big data cluster. And this has information like metadata for Hadoop or uh, external tables, which are a very important part of a big data cluster. Uh, also like shard maps for things like um, data that is stored in the, the other pools in the BDC. So I'm going to dedicate a slide here now to external tables because they're kind of important. Again, as I said, big data clusters leverage heavily the technologies of Polybase, and external tables are, you know, the key feature of Polybase. So most of the data in the big data cluster that is not residing on that master instance will be manifested as external tables. These allow you to expose data in SQL Server that is physically located elsewhere, right? So if you have, you know, data in a CSV file that's sitting on Hadoop or something like that, you can bring that into SQL Server very easily through an external table and be able to query it as if it were data located physically on that server, even though it may not be. Uh, you can query external tables and join them to other tables just like any other table. That's great. Uh, probably the biggest catch with them is they are read only. So you can you can create or select statistics, but you can't modify the data and you cannot uh, insert, update, or delete, or create indexes on any data in an external table. Um, as I said, SQL Server 2019 Polybase and its features are key for data virtualization in a SQL Server big data cluster. Um, and by doing this, you can avoid things like ETL, right? We don't have to load data into the database because we can query the data in place as it is. Um, we can also query external sources, you know, like remote SQL servers, Oracle servers, Azure Data Lake, Azure Blob Storage, Teradata. You name it, there's probably a Polybase connector for it that you can then leverage. Um, you do need to use sources that are supported by Polybase on Linux. Um, I believe there may still be a few sources that are not supported on Linux, so I can't think of any at the moment, uh, but that is something to keep in mind is everything is running in Linux under the covers. Next, we have the data pool. Um, and the data pool is a set of SQL Server instances that 
work together to provide storage and compute. And this is all managed behind the scenes in the big data cluster. When you're creating a big data cluster, which I'll talk about in a little bit at the beginning of the demos, you specify how many instances you want in that pool, but then that's all controlled by the BDC and you really don't have to worry about it. Um, query execution from the master instance can actually be offloaded to the data pool. If you issue a query on the master instance, the data pool will go out and the instances in the pool will go out and perform the work. Um, you can also, if you place data in the data pool, it gets distributed across all the instances. So let's say you have four servers in your data pool and you have a data set with 40 billion rows. If you were to push that data set to the data pool, well, each uh, server, each of those four instances would have one quarter of the data. And as you can see, my allergies are uh, in full swing tonight. So thankfully I'm quick with the uh, mute button so far at least. Next, we have the storage pool. So the data pool is the SQL server end. The storage pool is more the HDFS end. This provides a full HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System cluster within the big data cluster. This gives you your, your persistent storage for your big data, right? Your semi-structured, your unstructured data. You have data that's in CSV files or in parquet files, et cetera. You put them in this storage pool. It goes on the file system there and it's managed there. And then you can access this data that's in the storage pool through SQL Server, right? Once again, we could create external tables via Polybase and access it that way, or we could also query it through Spark. And when you query against data in the storage pool, um, you know, this, these operations are of course spread across all the machines that make up the storage pool, right? That's kind of how HDFS works. So at this point, we're almost at the end of the slides. Are there any questions on anything I've talked about to this point? And if anybody does, this would be a great time to unmute. If you're having troubles unmuting, let me know in the chat and I can unmute you. Okay, well, that, that's fine. If we don't have questions too, I'm happy to, happy to keep going here. All right, so. Those are kind of the, the basic features. And as I said, there's more components to a big data cluster as well. These are the ones that we're going to really be interacting with in today's demos and what I think are the most important ones to have a, an understanding about. So next, we're gonna talk briefly about just creating a big data cluster. Uh, creating a big data cluster is a process. It is, it is non-trivial. It is definitely not as easy as you know installing an instance of SQL Server where you can you know download some binaries and just go. You need a bunch of applications, a bunch of tools on your machine to create a big data cluster, even if you're creating it in the cloud. I think this is probably one of the, the first things I really had to grasp is you know normally if you're creating something in Azure or in any cloud, you don't really need anything on your computer, right? You go to the portal and you say, hey, I want a SQL Server, and it you know gives you back one in a couple of minutes later. Big data cluster, not that way. You actually need several different client tools on your machine to be able to do that. Um, Azure Data Studio makes it pretty easy. I'm actually going to go drag Azure Data Studio into the screen here and show you. Azure Data Studio has um, deployment wizards that will help you deploy many different things. If you go to Azure Data Studio and you click on your server up here, the three little dots in the corner there, you can hit new deployment. And it'll give you a bunch of options on what would you like to deploy. Uh, and they keep adding to this list all the time, but there is an, inst an option here for SQL Server Big Data Cluster. If you click that, it's going to start the wizard. It's gonna run through a whole bunch of prerequisites with you. You need kubectl, you need Azure CLI installed. Uh, you need the Azure Data CLI installed, which is that AZ data application I mentioned earlier. And if you work through this wizard, which you'll notice I'm not able to do on this machine because I was running into some issues the other day. I actually had to deploy my BDC from somewhere else, but it says it can't load deployment profiles. I haven't figured out exactly why yet. Uh, but if you work through this wizard, what it will do is it will eventually, and I'll, I'll pull it up on screen here so you can see, uh, it will eventually create for you a very nice uh, Python notebook. And so here, hang on, let me hit cancel and see if it will pull it up on screen for you. Here we go. So it will actually go ahead and if you work through the wizard, create this notebook where you basically pass in some information 
uh, your credentials and whatnot, and it will go through and you run this notebook and it will go spin up the big data cluster for you. Uh, and this is a, like I said, this is kind of an involved process. It has to go to Azure Kubernetes service, spin up however many uh, machines you need in Azure Kubernetes service. It'll then go build the big data cluster and return to you all the, the connection endpoints and whatnot. This takes for me about 15 to 20 minutes, which is why I'm not doing it as part of this demo because you don't want to sit here and watch this thing spin for that long. But it is, it is not as fast as installing an instance of SQL Server or uh, spinning up, uh, you know, Azure SQL database or something like that. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, so that is kind of the the very quick introduction to creating a big data cluster. Um, if we don't have any other, oh, one other thing I will point out here. So you need, as I said, you need uh, AZ Data, you need Cube Cuddle, you need um azure data studio really helps with that there is also there is a plugin for azure data studio here i will show you called the data virtualization plugin this is a plugin from microsoft um not absolutely required but it gives you all the wizards that make stuff easier uh when dealing with a bunch of things including big data clusters so i really recommend you have that installed as well uh but everything is free to all, all the tools you need are free. There's no charge for that other than, of course, if you're spinning up in Azure, you're going to incur some some costs there. Any other questions before we get started on the actual uh, querying of ABDC and working with it here? All right, that works for me. So I'm going to drag Azure Data Studio back in here. Um, and before I get started, I'm just going to give you a quick tour of what a big data cluster looks like in Azure Data Studio. As I said, I have one spun up in um, in Azure, so it's running an Azure Kubernetes service. I'm connected to it. Uh, you'll see it looks kind of like a regular SQL Server instance you'd be connecting to. Uh, if we click on databases, you'll see we have the same master model MSDB and TempDB system databases, but we have these other three databases off the bat. These are not ones that I created. These are part of, of managing the big data cluster. So there's DW configuration, DW diagnostics, and DWQ. Uh, I have never had a need to touch those. I do not touch them. I just let them do their thing. If I need to create other databases, I'll create other databases, but those are kind of like the system databases of the big data cluster. Probably the other most notable thing you'll see here is we do have a folder for HDFS. This is the Hadoop file system storage pool that's part of the big data cluster. Uh, so we can actually place and upload files into that, which we'll be doing in the demo shortly here. Uh, but you can also browse it uh, very easily. Uh, there is a thing down here for SQL Server big data clusters. And if I click on this and if I click on the right one, it'll kind of take me to where I'm going to show you anyway. It'll take you to manage, and I hope this is the right one. This might be the other cluster I created earlier. Hang on. One of these two should return a cluster for me to show you. Actually, maybe not. Hang on one second. Let's just go up here and click manage. There we go. OK, my bad. OK, yeah, it's asking me where I want to connect to for the, for the tool down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore that one for the moment. OK, so this is our big data cluster that I have spun up here. Um, again, you'll notice it looks kind of like a regular SQL Server database, but we do have some extra options here, like this one here that says SQL Server Big Data Cluster. So if we click on this, the first thing you'll get is a whole bunch of SQL notebooks. Um, essentially, all the support for big data clusters, they have pushed out two notebooks. So if you have any thing you want to do or trying to learn, you can work through these. They have troubleshooters. It's actually really, really nice that they provided all these in in the installation, more or less. Um, so that's kind of cool. You also see here we have all these service endpoints. So these are all the different services that are running as part of the big data cluster, uh, and it's telling you where they all are. So the first one up here is the SQL Server master instance. That's what I'm connected to. That's the front end for everything, uh, but there's a cluster management service. There's different dashboards. Uh, the, there's a specific gateway for accessing HDFS files. Uh, there's some various other proxies that are involved. So there's a whole bunch of connection endpoints. So they just give them to you in one nice, easy to see location. There's also this button here for cluster dashboard. And if we click that, we'll get we'll get the same set of endpoints we got before, but we'll also get information on each of the services 
they're all running, they're all healthy. Here's the SQL Server master instance that's running. Uh, HDFS is running. It's got a name node that's up. Spark's got one. Um, should have been two of these. Sorry, there's two in the storage queue. So there's the storage pool has two instances that are running there. Um, so you can see all the different components of your your big data cluster and how they're working. Um, I've never encountered an issue where something went went down or had a problem. Again, this is all being managed behind the scenes by Kubernetes. And one of the main features of Kubernetes is you tell Kubernetes, hey, give me X instances of something and it will go ahead and keep those alive. And if something dies, it'll go respawn right away and, and put it back. So and I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying what Kubernetes does and how it does it, but that's that's what's really this is really running on. Any other questions about this before we actually do some querying here? All right, so I'm going to go back to HDFS here, uh, and I have some queries, and I'm going to query some data for um, about airlines, actually. I know someone here said they were in aviation or, or used to be, so so this is a public data set available from Kaggle.com. I cannot link, or I cannot include these data sets with my downloads because of Kaggle's license, but I do give in my, my resource link a link to where to find them on Kaggle if you want to download them yourself. So I have some some pretty small but but reasonably good um, data sets to work with here for this. So first thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a folder in HDFS. As I mentioned, we have the storage pool. We can access it directly through Azure Data Studio. So if I wanted to create a new directory, I can right click on HDFS, say new directory. It'll pop up up here and say, hey, what, what name do you want to call that directory? So I'm going to call this one airlines. I'm going to break the rules and type during a demo, which I'm never supposed to do. And you'll notice, voila, we created an airlines folder here. I'm going to create a second folder inside that called CSV because I have some CSV data I want to put in there. So now I've got a CSV folder nested in there. And next I'm going to just upload a file. Uh, I have a folder call or a file called airlines.csv. So I am going to pull it over here and just select that folder and get that upload it and this is a really small file it's like 300 kilobytes so it should be oh great the socket hung up wonderful there we go oh apparently it didn't because it's there anyway all right phew crisis averted okay so our folder our file has been uploaded in this folder um if we were to right click on it we'll have some options for that file probably one of the, the easiest to show off is just preview where it will literally just go read the file uh, so we'll see if I can preview the file for you. Here you go. As we said, it's a CSV file of a whole bunch of airlines. Uh, and we have, you know, the airline ID, the name, the alias, some of the codes about it, whether it's active or not, what country it's from, et cetera. So that is just previewing the file. Um, you could also, if you wanted to create a polybase table for this in, in a couple easy clicks, you can right click and you can say virtualize data from CSV files. This is one of the features of that data virtualization plugin for Azure Data Studio I told you about, uh, is you get this nice wizard where you could click on it and uh, basically tell it where you'd like to, to virtualize this table to, and it will just go ahead and do it for you. But of course, I'm not a huge fan of wizards uh, when I can code it out myself instead. So that's what I've done here, and I think it makes for a better demo. So we have a notebook here, uh, Python, uh, SQL notebook which I need to uh, connect to my big data cluster. So give me one moment. There we go. <clears throat> so we're connected, so hopefully this will work. Uh, we're going to just, and, and I hope the text is big enough that you all can read. I have it zoomed in somewhat already. If it's too small to, to make out, please let me know. I'll make it bigger. Uh, but we have our, our just basic SQL statement to create a database called airlines data. Uh, we're going to use it, and we're going to create a schema in that database called CSV. <clears throat> Give that a second to think about its thing. So if I refresh my databases here, I'll now have airlines data, the database, right? No tables in it yet, just just a schema called CSV because I'm going to create a schema for each area that my, uh, my data is coming from. And you'll see why as we keep going here in the demo. So now that I've created the schema, I'm going to create an external table for this file. And again, if you're not familiar with external tables, this is basically creating a pointer in SQL Server that says, hey, we're going to manifest this, this table that's an external table. So it's not really a table. 
in the storage engine, but it is a pointer rather to data that exists somewhere else, in this case, a CSV file. So the first thing I need to do is set up my external data source, which is the storage pool in HDFS. Uh, so we're going to do that with the create external data source syntax here. This is pretty quick. Uh, we're also going to have to define what file format our file is in. It's a CSV format, so it's pretty easy. Um, so we're defining it as file format CSV. It's a delimited text format. Uh, the field terminator is a comma because it's a CSV file. Uh, and we're using uh, double quotes as string delimiters. And the first row contains the names of the columns. So we don't want to include that. So we're saying start the first row at row two. So we've defined our file format. Next, we need to define the table. And this looks a lot like a create table statement you'd use for any other uh, database. Uh, but you'll notice it is create external table. Uh, but we still have to de define the columns, the column lengths, and the, the null or not null attributes. Uh, but then at the bottom here, we have with location equals airlines CSV, airlines.csv. So we're saying define this table with these columns and these data types, uh, and then the data itself is located in the CSV file at this location uh, in the SQL storage pool in that file format called CSV. So there we go, we've done that. That is again, extremely fast. This is not loading any data into SQL Server. This is a metadata operation. It's basically creating a pointer. So SQL Server knows what it should be expecting and where to go look for this data. So if we were to refresh our tables here, you'll see we have csv.airlines, and it, it looks like a normal table. It's got all the columns and the data types in it, but it does say it's an external table, so you'll know. So now if we were to try to query this table, uh, we're just gonna select the top 100 rows from csv.airlines. I'm gonna click query, and it's gonna think for a second, and then it's gonna barf, right? And if you've ever worked with Polybase, you may have encountered something like this before. Um, essentially what this means is, uh, could not, well, actually, it's this is a different error than I'm used to, so we'll have to see if this, this runs into what it normally does. Um, okay, so could not fetch the row set. Usually it is not, usually it throws a different error. So let's hold this thought. Um, we're going to go to the next notebook here because this is, this is a error that's supposed to happen in this demo, at least at the beginning, and see if we can fix it. Um, so I'm going to a uh, Python, a PySpark notebook now, actually, right? So we're looking at the same data set, but instead of querying it with SQL Server, we're going to try to query it with Spark. Uh, and the reason is because Spark can be more forgiving. Uh, SQL Server is pretty rigid with its data types. Remember, we had to define the data types and the sizes and the widths and everything when we create this external table, whereas Spark doesn't really care as much. Uh, it'll read whatever it can read. So we're going to, once again, point to our big data cluster. There we go. Missing required index for one. Did it not? Hang on. Hang on. Let's see if I can run this. Kernel is dead. I am having a wonderful day. Um, so you get to watch me do some. Sometimes the kernel dies. Uh, I have noticed this where if you have it sitting around for too long, you're not querying it like when I'm giving the rest of the presentation. Uh, it will, in fact, die and you have to reconnect and that's fine. Uh, I am trying to figure out why it is not wanting to connect to my big data cluster. Is it attached? It says it's attached. It says it's online. Let's see if I can query this. Okay, there we go. Now this is normal. This is gonna take 15, 20 seconds to actually start up Spark. Uh, so when I go to my other Spark notebook later, I may have the same issue and have to reload the file. But let's find out. So this is gonna start Spark. And what this is, is this is a Spark query. Uh, once again, we're querying this airline CSV, airlines.csv file. Uh, we're reading in the file and we're just reading in the first 10 rows, basically. I want to say, hey, can Spark read this file? Can it make heads or tails of it? Uh, can it make read the first 10 rows? So it's doing its thing here. And once it gets started, it should actually return that data to me. And like I said, this usually takes 15, 20 seconds. There we go. Okay. So I queried the first 10 rows of the table. You'll notice it will spit out a table for me here with the nice column names and the information we have. So every airline has an ID, uh, name of the airlines, aliases, codes, call signs, etc. So, and again, this is not a session on Spark, and nor would I be the best person to deliver it. But what we're creating here is a data frame. So you'll notice we have this DF equals this statement. We're basically creating this, this data frame object that you can read from. And I'm specifying it as being the CSV file. And I'm saying, show me the first 10 rows of the data frame, which it did. 
Um, we can say df.print schema and print information about what Spark sees these data types as. Now you'll notice Spark's data types are a bit more simplistic here, what it's inferring from the data set. Whereas in SQL Server, we have you know char with a length or varchar with a length. Uh, here, everything is either integer or string, right? And whether or not it's nullable. So the, the Spark data frame itself doesn't provide a whole lot of information. Uh, I'm gonna use another tool set for Spark called pandas, and I'm going to create a data frame in pandas very quickly. Um, and then I am going to run a command in that to just scan the data set very quickly uh, and tell me what is the longest value in each column, right? So essentially what we have here is there was an error in SQL Server when we created the table. We created the country column and we said country had a length of 10. Well, the longest value in the country column is actually 32. So the error that I invented that should have just spit back invalid column length and is now erroring with something else means I might have a bigger problem. Uh, but we're going to go back to our SQL query right now, and we're going to drop our external table, which again is easy. Uh, we're going to change the country to a length of 50 instead of 10, right? which should resolve that problem, though I can't promise it's going to resolve the other problems I'm having. So we're going to now, now that we've recreated that external table with the proper data type length, let's see if we can query this now. Woohoo, there we go. All right, so I have now queried this external table, csv.airlines, reading from a CSV table, right? I'm getting the top 100 rows of that. We got our data here, that's awesome. Uh, now, as I've mentioned before, external tables are great, uh, but they're read-only, so you can't do anything with them. You can't change the data in them. You can't try to create indexes on them. If you did, you'll get an error here, like indexes are not supported with external tables. Uh, or the same if you try to select, you know, or to run an update, it'll say, you know, DML operations are not supported. The only thing you can do with an external table really is select from them. Like this final query here where I say select star from csv.airlines, you know, where country equals Belgium and active equals Y. And then it will return zero because apparently in this data set there are no active airlines from Belgium, which I thought there were last time I ran this, but who knows. Um, so that is just kind of the first very brief introduction to querying as an external table and querying with Spark in a big data cluster. Are there any questions? Nothing at all. Everyone is mesmerized, which is awesome. Quiet, but still here. <laughs> Everybody, no, nobody left. OK, well, that's good, too, that, that, you know. But if you have to leave, you won't hurt my feelings. Um, OK, so I'm going to I'm going to keep talking about other things. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work with a slightly bigger data set for the next one, which is called flight delays. Uh, and rather than uh, do the whole GUI, create folder, create file and upload, I'm going to use one of the web services. So because uh, they do have the Spark endpoints exposed as part of the big data cluster, I can run this script I have here and basically Go ahead. Yes, you can see my password if you want to try to figure out what IP address and connect to it real quick before I destroy these. Uh, oh, actually, hang on. I'm getting errors now. Okay, this might make things interesting. This worked earlier. I'm attached to localhost. Give me a minute to uh, get this notebook reloaded here. I'm sorry. I did a dry run earlier today and everything worked. What are we dying about now? Cube cuddle, get service gateway, da, 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 shoot. Okay, so to alleviate this problem, I am going to do the upload manually, but it's going to take a little bit, but that's okay. It wouldn't be any faster through this anyway. I got this flight delays data set, which is a bit bigger. Um, so I'm gonna create a flight delays folder and a CSV folder inside of that. Again, well, if anyone has questions while I'm doing this, I'll be more than happy to answer it. I've got a flight delays folder, I've got a CSV folder inside of flight delays, and I'm going to upload my flight delays file into here. Probably the most annoying part is I don't get any uh, updates on how far along this update is. And since it gave me that error last time and it still uploaded the data anyway, I'm gonna assume that it's going to work. Um, so we gotta chill here for a minute while this uploads. Um, really no other questions or anything? we don't that's fine um let's see is it uploaded yet oh there we go we got flight delays.csv so this is a it's like 136 megabyte file of 
flight delay information again available from kaggle.com uh i will try to preview it we will see if it blows up in my face or not there we go so this is a ton of information looks like it's i think it's from like 2008 and 2009 of flights that were delayed we have the date information we have the time the flight was supposed to leave the time it actually left the time it was supposed to you know land time it actually landed what tail number it was what flight number it was where it was going to where it was coming from etc all this information and flight delays just gives us another decent data set to work with so once again i'm going to need to create an external table uh, for flight delays so let me connect to my bdc here because logged failed did it not save my password okay hang on one moment let me grab my password I'm starting to think that azure data studio is possessed on me tonight this all just worked before okay so i'm going to once again use the airlines data database i'm going to create another external table uh, in our airlines data database but i have all the proper data types this time uh, as you can see the columns here year, month, day of month, et cetera, flight number, tail number, uh, pointing now at the flight delays.csv file, once again, located in the SQL storage pool and in the CSV file format. And I promise you all the data types are right, so we're not gonna get contrived errors for that. So if I refresh this, you'll see we have two tables now. We have csv.airlines and csv.flightdelays. Uh, both of these uh, base, the source for both of these external tables are in fact CSV files. And just to show you that it works, I'll select the top 100 from csv.flightdelays, and I'm getting another error. Man, this is, you know, I am not having a great day today. Okay, I'm going to try to stop and restart the file real quick. This I have not actually encountered before. Again, as you can see by the confusion on my face here. So we have this. I should be able to connect to the BDC. Folks, I am sorry for this lackluster demo performance. I actually have dem uh, videos of where they all work, which I can gladly point you to if you want to see how this should work. Um, okay, so it is not invalid or no active name node found. Well, it is valid because the file exists there and we were able to query it. Great. So because of that, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do anything else, but I'm going to keep trying anyway. Um, <clears throat> Cannot fetch the row set for linked server null. Well, it was in there and we defined it. I'm going to drop the table and try to recreate it again just for heck of it. This is what you call an extra spicy demo. Oh yeah, no, this is this is extra special. I'm sorry, folks. Um, so we're going to see if we can do anything else with this. Um, I am going to, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Parquet format, right? We have CSV, which is, of course, just, just a wonderful text file with commas, which is great. Um, and it's very easy to read, and pretty much anything can work with a CSV file. Uh, but in the, the data science land, uh, Parquet files are also quite prevalent and popular and have some distinct advantages, like they're compressed, uh, and they use, use better encodings, and you don't have to worry about things like, like, file type encoding mismatches um, they're, comp they're compressed in a per column uh, basis so you can get some great efficiencies and columnation and all kinds of other stuff with them so a lot of times you'll see data in a parquet format instead of a csv file um, so i'm actually going to try to create or try to put this data into a parquet format as well we're going to see if this works or not i need to create a schema so i'm going to create a schema called parquet i'm going to create a file format also called parquet so that sql server knows what it's reading uh, and I am going to go out and create Parquet files. Uh, and I'm going to do this using Spark. So we're going to go back here to Spark, which I'm just going to close and reopen right now, because I'm sure if I didn't, it would tell me that the kernel was dead anyway. So we're going to reopen this file, wait for the kernel to load and connect to our big data cluster, which is now green. It was red before. It should always be green. Missing required inputs. OK, did it not have my password in there again? No, the password's there. Something's possessed in here, and I don't know what. Spark kernels require to a connection to a big data cluster. You're right, they do, and I have one right here, and I'll put the password in again. Doesn't this just make you want to use a big data cluster? Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Okay, so I think we're connected. So now what I'm going to do in PySpark, again, my very, very simplistic understanding, I'm going to create a data frame where I'm reading in 
that whole flight delays.csv file here and see if I can just show you the top 10 rows in it to see if it actually works. And again, this is going to take a little bit to try and smell. Oh, it's not even spinning up Spark. I am really sorry, folks. This is just not my night for demos. Okay, are we connected? Does it say we're connected? Here's the password. We're connected, I think. <clears throat> Yes, I have enough resources to do this. OK, let's close it again and try once more. If this doesn't work again, I'm just going to not have a great day here. Oh. Are we connected? Do we think we're connected? Ooh. OK, this is this is possessed or something like that. So if this actually works, we'll wait our 30 seconds again for Spark to start up and, and query the files. And then I'll move on to actually running this next one that so says df.write.parquet. And I'll talk a little bit more about Parquet files. Again, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with them. Uh, if you are familiar with them, you probably know way more about them than I do. But in a lot of data science applications, you have you have massive farms of machines right running massively parallel applications trying to scan and work through as much data as possible it works a lot better if you have oh really can't even read this basically you'll you'll be pointing to a directory right so if i were to actually be able to create a parquet set of files in this directory which apparently i am not because it can't even read from these files right now um and i am truly sorry for this did my Flight delays CSV, flight delays that CSV, it's there. Um, I wonder if because I typed this and I didn't use my hang on, if this is if this is the answer, then I'm just dumb. Let's see if this solves it. Um, because I think if I had used been able to use the script, it would have capitalized the file correctly. So I might have to change. There we go. Look at that. Okay. So Solve because Bob's an idiot and, you know, Linux is case sensitive with file names. So what I've done here is I've queried the top 10 rows of this file um, and show networks. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to write this data frame into a Parquet data set. Now what it's going to do is it's going to create a folder called flight delays slash Parquet, and it's going to convert this data into some Parquet files and put them in there. And this shouldn't take very long. In fact, it might be done already. So let's refresh. Oh, look at that. We have a Parquet folder uh, and we have our file in the Parquet format. So I have converted it. You'll notice it's named with a with a GUID and some other things here. Um, if you had multiple uh, query processors running, you would actually get multiple Parquet files. Um, and because you'll end up pointing the engine at a directory, not at a specific file, and then it will go with all its threads and its worker nodes and read across all of them, which is what the big data cluster will do too. So I've created the Parquet file, which is half the battle. Um, I have this external table here I'm going to try to create. Let's see if this actually works. That worked too. This might have all been caused by me not knowing how to capitalize a file name, in which case I am very sorry. So let's see if I can select the top 100 rows from Parquet to flight delays. Oh, look at that, it worked. All right, so I have now, I just queried this data, same data, but instead of querying it from a CSV file, I queried it from a Parquet file now, right? Ooh, exciting, I queried it from a different format. Well, we, we can do some cool things with that when it's in that format. Um, one of the other things I'm gonna show you though is the SQL Server data pool, while we still have some time left. Um, and again, I, I appreciate you all sticking with me while I'm debugging my own mistakes on the fly here. Uh, we're going to copy this data into the SQL Server data pool. Now, what I mentioned before, the SQL Server data pool is a pool made up of multiple nodes, uh, in this case, two of them, and it will distribute the data equally between those nodes. 
So what I'm going to do here is I am going to create an external data source called SQL data pool, and it's going to point to the data pool, right? And they have their own little location format for this. So it's SQL data pool colon slash slash controller service dot default or slash default. So I'm going to create this SQL data pool external data source. I'm going to create a schema called data pool, and I'm going to create another external table for the same flight delay data in this SQL data pool data source. So you'll notice I'm creating an external data, external table. I got all my columns and my types here with data source equals SQL data pool, distribution equals round robin. This means it will round robin the, no, the rows between the nodes of the SQL Server data pool. Again, there are two of them. So that should be a pretty quick operation there. There we go. I'm now going to actually copy my data from the CSV file into the SQL Server data pool. So we're inserting into the table data pool dot flight delays. And why is this dying now? Oh, you know what? It's dying because the flight delay CSV file is wrong. Hang on one second. We're going to go back up here and fix this. Right, because remember, I capitalized it and I shouldn't have. So we're going to drop this external table. We're going to rename it with capital F and capital D for flight delays, recreate it. And now if I go back down here to my query, which is actually trying to read from that external table, I bet you this will work. Oh, there we go. But only 2,160 rows affected. OK, that's not good because um, there should be like 19 million rows in this table. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Did they did they make it in there really? I got 2,100 rows. Okay, this is gonna be a really lame demo. Um, I have no clue why it didn't copy all the rows from the table into there. My guess is probably something flaky with what Spark was doing earlier. Uh, but for fun here, I'm gonna run this query. This is. This is, an, you'll notice it says exec use airlines data, select count star from data pool dot flight delays at data source SQL data pool. So what we're doing here is we're counting the number of rows in the table, right? We got count star, select count star from, from table. That's cool. Uh, but this at data source part, what this is actually going to do is this is going to query, run the query separately on each node in the data pool and return the results separately. So again, there should be 19 million rows. There's not. Uh, we have 2160 rows total, and we have 1124 and 1036, which is about what I would expect. Uh, from my experience, when you say round robin, it doesn't actually round robin every single row. It tends to batch them in rows that look to be about 256 uh, from what I've noticed. So to see 1036, well, it's a little more than two. I guess it should have been 1024 then, but that, that's about what it appeared to be. Uh, I am still really confused as to why I didn't get all the data. In fact, I kind of want to try again to see if I can generate the Parquet data properly. So I'm actually going to delete the Parquet data and try to regenerate it. So give me a second here because we have, we have a few minutes so I can play with this. Let's try this again. Error was encountered. Yes, something, something, well, it already exists. No, it shouldn't exist. Oh, the directory already exists. Okay, let's delete the directory too. I could be breaking everything right now for all I know. Yeah, that finished way too quickly. That finished way too fast. Flight delays, parquet, and there should be two files there, not one. So I am not exactly sure what happened with this. Uh, I'm going to try to, let's just select star from parquet.flight delays and see how many rows are in here, because I'm just curious. Maybe there will be more or less than before. 2160. I don't know why it's coming up with 2160. There's more than 2160 in the file. Um, anyhow, the way this normally would work is, I would have about 19 million file, 19 million rows in my flight delay data set. I would do a count from csv.flightdelays. Okay, maybe my data really did get screwed up. Maybe there really are 2160. All right, this is, I thank you all for your patience. Let's put it this way. So I got 2160 on all of them, which, which kind of is such a small data set, it doesn't even matter. Uh, but what I would normally point out, and what I'll point out here, because it still kind of seems... Kind of true, not really. So when I'm counting all the data in my CSV file and you have millions of rows like a normal big data data set would, it would take take about seven seconds or so for 
uh, SQL Server to read through the CSV file and return all the data to you. In this case, it's taking three tenths of a second. So I would do the same thing again with my machine just blue screen. No, it just OK, never mind. Uh, with everything else that's gone wrong, who knows? Um, so then I would go ahead and do it with Parquet, and Parquet would be way faster. Parquet would be, it would be like seven seconds to read the CSV. It would be like one second to read it in Parquet. Because remember, Parquet is compressed and optimized, and there's probably metadata going on somewhere too where it can count all the rows without actually counting all the rows. And then I would go to the data pool, which again has this data spread out across multiple SQL servers, and it would be even faster. Now I will notice that the data pool querying is still the fastest. It's 0.24 seconds, which is faster than CSV or Parquet, but the, the results are far less dramatic here due to the uh, diminished size of the data set we're working for. And as a, a final thing, I, I like to show off that yes, you can in Polybase join between all these sources, right? So I have a query here where I'm joining the parquet copy of flight delays to the csv.airlines file, uh, and I'm able to join these data sets just like I would be able to uh, with any other SQL Server data query, whether it was an external table or not. And of course, because things are going so well tonight, I get zero rows instead of anything. So this has been an absolutely terrible demo, but I will tell you that if you go to the link that I post at the end, uh, I do have a video of these demos actually working. So if you'd like to see that there, uh, that would be the great way to do it. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to uh, call this demo dumpster fire, uh, get rid of that here, and just, just go up to my ending slide so I can uh, put this presentation to, uh, to bed like it should be. So I have a bunch of resources I'd like to share. Uh, Microsoft has a workshop on big data clusters architecture. This is literally like a full day you can work through and gives you an understanding of how big data clusters is built on Kubernetes. Uh, very, very interesting, all free. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Kubernetes uh, in general, Klaus and Anthony Nocentino have great material on Kubernetes. Uh, Mohammed Darab has some excellent material on BDCs in general. He also covers Kubernetes as well, but he had some really good blogs on uh, just big data clusters and his experiences with them. Uh, ben Weissman, if you know him from Germany, great guy. Uh, he has a whole plural site course on big data clusters, specifically building and, and getting started with them. That's excellent if you have plural site. Uh, and if you'd like to see my material, uh, that, that again includes, I should have a video up there uh, where these demos work. If not, I will put one there and it'll be there tomorrow. Uh, go to babusateri.com slash r slash ABCs of BDCs. Here I have it again on the last slide and you can get all these materials there. And once again, I have my contact information here on the screen. If you have any other questions that we can't get to in this session or your watching the video of this later and saying, wow, Bob, that was a totally awful session. Uh, you just wasted time that I'll never get back and you wanna you know, tell me about it, that's fine. I apologize in advance, but I'm happy to hear. As I always like to say, if you think it's a great presentation, I'd love to hear that. If you think it's terrible, that's great too. If you could do me a favor and tell me why, like because my demos sucked, that'd be great too. Otherwise, that's all I had planned. So I don't know if we have any, any questions or comments that were brewing throughout all that, but if, if you do, I'd be more than happy to take them. Well, Bob, I like to say, if you like it, tell your friends. If you don't like it, tell your enemies. So Ooh, that. okay. That's a good one. I never heard that one before. <laughs> but it feels like uh, Murphy and his law did not come to play today. <laughs> no. What's even funnier is I, I do a dry run like the afternoon before I do any presentation and everything works. So I don't know if something went wonky in my, my BDC or, or what happened here, but I do apologize for the, the lackluster performance. Well, having the link is is very appreciated and will be very helpful. Yeah, that'll take you straight to my uh, my GitHub actually, uh, where I post all my materials. That's amazing. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I don't see any. No questions. Huh? Okay. All right. Um, we'll hang. Oh, someone is typing. Brian, you can take yourself off mute. If you can't let me know and I'll take you off mute.
And if you prefer not to speak, I get that too. But there is a question coming in. Okay. Uh, Brian actually said something very kind. <laughs> it's not a question. It's a really nice comment. It says, maybe Bob will do another similar session in the future. Thanks all. Well, I'd be happy to if you want to have me back. You know, I can, I can do what I can to make sure it actually works this time. We will be back in the new year. And everyone will have the pleasure of having Randolph hosting. I do I see a, people starting to log off. Yeah, ask your question, Evan. I have a question. How long have uh, big data clusters been around for? Um, they've been around. Well, they were released with SQL Server 2019, um, so they they were officially you know GA'd at that time. They were around a little bit before it for you know internal testing and whatnot. But that that, that 2019 was the first release of them. Thank you. No problem. That was a great question. Thank you, Evan. Uh, while well, we wait and see if there are further questions, so there won't be another session next month. This was our last one of the year. Uh, luckily, Randolph will be back to host next uh, year. That's so weird to say in November, but that's <laughs> what we're saying. <laughs> with some new sessions. Um, if you haven't recently, please go to www.calvarydata.org and check out the group. Folks are hanging on, which makes me wonder if anybody has questions. I am actually adding the link to uh, my my video of this from past summit last year, past summit 2020, uh, to that GitHub page like right now. Amazing. So it will be up so there very shortly. So that might be the place to go after. Mm -hmm. We do have some folks heading out, it looks like. Uh, so I guess if there aren't any more questions, I'll let everybody get on to dinner. And I'm sure you have things you'd like to do as well tonight, Bob. <laughs> oh, I've got a table for 17 to set. So that'll be our evening activity here, at least. That is a lot of folks. And Thanksgiving is, uh, I, I'm sure the turkey is already thawed, ready to go. Oh yes, we have we have one that's going in the oven tomorrow, and then I, I happen to have a really good barbecue place across the street from my house, so I got like eight extra pounds of smoked turkey breast oh, coming nice. from that uh, that barbecue place. So that'll be want as well. I was half hoping you'd say brisket. I, I actually I have four pounds of brisket coming too. So oh yes, that's the stuff right there. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, I guess, everyone for coming. I will hang on for a little bit if anybody's got anything, any questions. Um, yeah, we'll see everybody in the new year. Please check out calgarydata.org. Very good. Again, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I'll you know, be happy to present again at some point. Thanks, Bob. And uh, despite some of the challenges you had with the demos, I, I found it quite helpful to to uh, to give ideas uh, to move forward for future solutions that I build. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.